suffering is a gift. And that's a messed up statement. It actually is like the most illogical statement I could make, but having experienced it for the last 15 years in real ways, I can actually sit here today and be like, it's been a gift in our lives. It's helped us have a context for hope. Like, how do you have a context for what day is if we don't have night, right? Mm -hmm. If all we had was sunlight and no point the sun went away, it would just be normal, right? But because the sun goes away and we've got nighttime, we can have a context for day. Same way with suffering and hope. I can understand hope in a, like a weird way because of the suffering. Welcome to GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, a.k.a. the Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, it's the Going North Podcast, and we got another super special, awesome human for you today, my friends, that's right indeed, here's a fellow child of the king, y'all, that's right indeed, and not only that, to put the icing on the cake, he's a man of the cloth, baby, that's right indeed, so all the bed sheets and the towels, baby, that's right indeed, so, you know, catch the spirit, and then out of nowhere, it's like, you know what, I need to cool off for a bit, my man's got you covered, because you be shouting for joy because today's guest is a pastor and a coach that believes in faith resilience and using the power of wisdom to really amplify your life and use it to amplify the lives of others let's give it up for jb himself the joyful and benevolent jim bernard how you doing today jim yo dom long time listener first time caller man like pumped to be here <laughs> <laughs> All the iron, all the pumping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, how you living? How's 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 life today? You doing good? Life is good every time I'm on this side of the grass. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. Man, thank you for that great introduction. I really appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure, man. It's usually the best part of the show before the rabbit holes up here. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah don't worry some of the bunnies have bibles it's okay <laughs> all right i'll preach to them it's fine i don't care <laughs> yeah there we go that's right the energized bunny is busy reading the bible beating the drum baby that's right and it's like hey i've been preaching for two hours this bunny just keeps beating the drum i guess who wants him to keep going <laughs> <laughs> keep it going yes yes <laughs> oh uh, my god it ain't about buddies, it's about the mighty gym, man. So my goodness, as with all introductions, they're not allowed to be 73 and a half days long, and I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of stuff I may have forgotten to add. So am I filling in any cavities I may have missed about you, my man? Man, I appreciate that. So I guess I'm an author. That seems weird to say out loud. Like, uh, that's, that's a thing that I never really expected in my life, but I got to write this uh, great book and release it last year, and it's our, it's our story of suffering. You know, it's a story that I would have never written for myself, like not in a million years, but it's the story that God has written in my life and uh, definitely felt a great calling to be able to share that with people. Uh, and it's kind of what I do professionally. You, you introduced me as a coach. I'm a, I'm a pastor, a freelance pastor that comes alongside people that are walking through suffering. Basically, I call it their expectation gaps. It's something I've become an, an expert at living with an expectation gap, you know, where my reality is far from my expectations. And uh, it's a privilege to serve people that way. So being able to share my story is at the at the center of that and the books uh, going well. And it's just a blessing to be able to uh, encourage people where they're at, you know. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. Where they at, indeed. That's right, indeed. <laughs> and I love that, too, indeed. So my goodness. So what led you to become a pastor because if i'm not mistaken like even before the big story and well i guess marathon of suffering started you mm -hmm. actually have history in the church man so my goodness what led you to become a pastor i mean if i'm being honest dom i had no interest in, in going into ministry i it was not on my radar at all I, I was a business and marketing major in college and i was 
you know, off and running in this, you know, career that, uh, you know, I was building and, you know, ultimately like life probably changed when I met my wife, how I met her was I had started going to this new church and I had just kind of left a church that had some drama and shenanigans happening and it was kind of ouchy, you know? And so I was going to this new church, but I was like, not going to serve, not going to like be anything other than a face in the crowd. I was just going to consume and see if it was a safe place. But there's this gal, my future wife up on stage giving announcements and uh, she was cute, you know, so I was paying attention, you know, I was like, okay, what, what do you have to say? Like, give me all the info. And uh, during these announcements, the sound booth is just jacking everything up, like just all these technical mishaps are happening. And she's dealing with it with grace and humor. And suddenly I'm like, you know what? I really need to rethink this position about not serving. I need to get involved, you know, <laughs> like the Holy Spirit had come upon me. <laughs> but <laughs> I go up to her after church and, I, and I'm trying to introduce myself, tell her I you know, I, I want to serve, like, how can I get connected? And she sees right through my motives. She understands what's happening here. And so she starts flirting back with me. And she's like, man, we've got really high standards at Quest Church. And uh, uh, I don't know if you'd be able to make the grade, you know, I, I don't know. And so I'm like, okay, let me send you my resume. How about that? Like some references, like, I'm like the world's worst flirter. I like, I'm trying to be JB smooth up in here, but no, like <laughs> it was rough. So, you know, next week I come up and find her after church and I'm like, Hey, yo, you're pretty impressed at, right. You know, when do I start? And she's like, man, I, like for real, some of the references were pretty sketchy. You know, I, I, we might be able to have you start on a probationary basis or something. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I hope she's flirting with me. I hope that this isn't for real. Like if this church might be super jacked. So I uh, mustered up my courage, you know, and I was like, hey, you know, if we uh, if we wanted an interview, you'd see just how fortunate, how lucky you'd be to have me on your team. And she's like, yeah, let's do that. Let's go on an interview. So we started dating right away. And uh, man, I fell in love with Alicia, like her love for Jesus. She's unbelievably smart. She um, strong will, just so cool. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, God, thank you. This is amazing. We dated for a year and a half. Um, I finally asked her to marry me. It was like literally the worst proposal of all time. You'll have to read the book to, to see what that was about. But, um, she said, yes, uh, it was really pathetic, but she said yes. And that's on her. We had a super, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we had a super short engagement, uh, 10 weeks long, and, uh, you know, really there was like a venue, uh, issue there, but, uh, at the end of the day, I think God knew what was happening and, uh, he had mapped out something we could never foresee because three months into our marriage, Alicia got super sick, like the, like life fell apart, kind of sick. Um, and if we had had a normal length engagement, maybe she would have gotten sick before I had made that commitment before I had made a covenant with her. And I don't know if I would have stayed. I just don't know. And, I can sit here today saying I'm very thankful that it happened in the order of operations that it did. Now, it wasn't easy, Dom. It was <laughs> as far from easy as possible. Like it was uh, suddenly at first it was like, okay, she's maybe got the stomach flu. She's just puking a ton, like hours a day. It's just like a vomit city. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, <laughs> you know, after uh, a week or two, it's like, hold up, this is not going away. Like what? <laughs> what's happening here? And so we started to panic a little bit. We went to the emergency room. We started visiting all these doctors, trying to get some answers. Like what, what's happening here? We meet this really kind GI doctor who is sympathetic and wants to help us, but he's like, man, I think it's going to take like a ton of testing to try to figure this out. Cause you seem super complicated. And so he suggested that we maybe go to the Mayo Clinic where, you know, up in Minnesota, they've got all the best tests and amazing doctors and world-class stuff. And he's like, I, I, I think that's going to be our fastest path to an answer. And so we're like, all right, let's do this. You know, I had just burned all my vacation time on uh, the, the wedding and the honeymoon and I had no time off left. So I was only able to go up with Alicia for the first initial meeting with the, with the managing doctor, you know, which was fine. He just did all the normal stuff. Like, you know, tell me about your symptoms, tell me about your family history, that kind of stuff. 
we only had like 15 minutes with this guy. And so it was like, all right, well, and he, he set this plan forth where she was going to do like these several dozens of tests and meet with these like bunch of doctors and all these, these things. Like it was going to take three months for her to do all this stuff. And uh, fortunately we, we had friends and family that were able to stay up there with her. So she wasn't alone. And this season was rough, man. Like I, grief is such a funny thing. I, 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 I don't know if any of us are really prepared for grief. Like I think grief is a habit and most of us have a habit that's not all that functional, all that effective. And my grieving pattern was just to like shut down and isolate. You know, I just wanted to, I guess, be depressed, you know, and depression is definitely part of my story. I, I hate that, but I was starting to, to pull away in some, in, in some real ways. And Fortunately, I was part of a church community that knew me and loved me. And they like rallied around side of me. They said, you're not alone. We're going to experience victory together. They held my arms up when I was weak and weary. Like they were, they were, they were amazing. Like they were doing the work of the church, like right, right there in my life. And when Alicia was at at the end of the Mayo Clinic uh, endeavor, I went back up for like the concluding meeting, like, all right, this is the problem. Here's the solutions. Like we're going to, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. So I needed to be there. So I, I went back up and uh, we sat down with that same doctor and he walks into the room and and says, all right, Alicia, we don't have much time. So I'm just going to cut straight to it. Uh, I, I believe you're a ruminator. And uh, Alicia's way smarter than me. I'm typically not the smartest person in the room. Definitely not in this room. Um, I was like, what does that mean? You know, I'm, I'm clueless. But Alicia got it right away. And she's starting to kind of fight this guy. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you think I'm crazy? Do you think I'm nuts? And, uh, you know, the doctor's like, no, you're not crazy. I just feel like you've got some emotional things that you haven't dealt with very well and it's causing some physical issues and you know if we got you in with a counselor some of this stuff would go away and i'm like what what are we talking about like i I was so confused and honestly I, i i regret this to this day that i didn't know how to advocate for my wife you know like we were newly married i was lost and confused i was intimidated like i just sat there and like let this moment happen and Alicia's fighting this dude like, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. What about all these terrible tests you put me through? Like, what about this anal rectal manometry thing that you, that was awful. Like, what are the results of that? And he's like, oh, I, like, I don't know. And he's like opening the chart and clearly looking at the results of these tests for the first time. And he's like, oh, yeah, that, oh, God. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. Huh. And then well, like, what about biofeedback? What about this terror? Like she did like dozens of the worst, most humiliating, just awful invasive tests. And this, this cat's not like informed on any of it. Like, he prescribed it, but he doesn't know he had just made this conclusion. And so Alicia's like, you know, the guy's trying to get out of the room. He's got to get onto another patient. He's like, I'm sorry, my time's up. And he's just like, no, 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 no. Like what, what, what about me makes you think that I'm a ruminator? And he said, well, you know, Alicia, at our first meeting, when I was asking you about family history, you indicated that there was some abuse in your home, you know, and that's true. You know, I can't, I can't claim that she had the, the, the daddy of the year in her home. Right. Uh, but a lot of that stuff was like him versus Alicia's mom. Right. And, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't awesome, but once again, I'm just sitting there not helping her at all. I'm, I, like I should have been like, no way, man. Like she's the most emo- emotionally, spiritually healthy person I've ever met in my life. Like we're not accepting this answer. Well, he just was like, I- I'm sorry. Like you, you, if, if you need a reference to a counselor, let my office know and he's out the door. And we left Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic super dejected. It was awful. So we go back to see this doctor in St. Louis that had referred us up to the Mayo Clinic because he was anxious to hear, hey, what happened? What, were, what, were, what was the outcome? And I think uh, it's pretty obvious to say that both of us were really nervous that this doctor was going to affirm the, the expert at the Mayo Clinic that, you know, he's, <laughs> he's the, the top notch doctor. Like, I'm going to agree with him. So we sit down with him. We're in a similar small room as we were with the guy up in Mayo. And I, I literally thought I was going to puke, man. I was so nervous about this moment. And, uh, you know, finally, after looking at the, these charts and, and test results and whatever for several minutes of silence, 
he looks up at Alicia and says, honey, it's not in your head. It's in your gut. I'm so sorry that you had to endure some, some craziness with this guy and this terrible conclusion and how he tr treated you was not fair, but um, I'm really glad that, that you went because we got test results that we would have never gotten in like years down here. So this was all worth it. And pretty quickly he identified that, uh, okay, so she's got a connective tissue disease that's called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. If you've ever seen a contortionist, someone that can bend their joints in any direction, they've got what we call the cool version of this disease. Uh, it, it's a hyperflexibility located in their joints. We call it the cool version. It's definitely painful. Like there's, it's, it's not awesome, but at least you've got some party tricks that you can show your friends on a Friday <laughs> night. Like, look what I can do. Um, but Alicia's version is basically located in her abdomen. So everything in her core, like her digestive system has no muscle tone pushing food through. So she'll eat something it'll get clogged. She'll eat something else. And because there's no room in the inn, like <laughs> she's just vomiting for like hours a day. Uh, and you know, the, her organs in her midsection have all prolapsed or fallen out of place. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, this is disastrous. Like this doctor f found this and he's like, Hey, I think this is, uh, primarily located in your colon. So I, I want, I want to take your colon out, you know, which is like, uh, okay, I, like, let's roll, let's do it. So he does it and Alicia gets better. Like she really does. Like she can start to eat again. And she's like, I've got my wife back, you know, like things are really awesome. Um, but the doctor, when he got the pathology re results back, they, you know, went and looked at the colon and tried to understand what was going on. He's like, we've never seen a colon like this. It was, uh, it was paper thin and PVC pipe hard. And he's like, man, you would have torn your colon within a matter of weeks if we didn't do this. Like, mm. uh, thank God that we, <laughs> we did all this, you know, and that this doctor was able to see this through and save her life. And, you know, like she, she got better for a season, but eventually this disease as it does, it's pretty degenerative and it's continued through her digestive system. It's continued to cause havoc. And uh, Dom, I'll, I'll tell you, man, she's spent hundreds of nights in the hospital uh, over the last 15 years. She's had dozens of surgeries. Um, she's essentially died on me twice. I've held her lifeless body in my arms. Um, and it's it's been a long, hard road, like 15 years of pretty much outside of like that post colon season. And then one other season of, of you know, God doing a crazy intervention in our life. Like she's gone downhill over 15 years. It's been miserable. It's been terrible. There's been so much suffering. Like the stories are hard to tell, man. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like there are some tragic stories in there. But at the end of the day, you, you asked the question about like being in ministry, like <laughs> at some point God was like poking at me, like, Hey man, I, I want you to do ministry. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't be serious, God. Like, there's no way I'm going to do that. Ministry is complicated. If I'm doing it well, it's going to be very complicated and look at the complicated life you've given me. I, there's no way I'm not doing it. And I just kept giving God the Heisman stiff arm move. Like just get away from me, man. I'm not about it. And he just kept getting consistent and louder. And, uh, you know, I, I allude to this other season of where Alicia got better. It's a long story. So I'm going to give like the super cliff notes version. Uh, it was impossible for us to get pregnant. We had tried every which way, seen every specialist and everyone's like, man, impossible for you to get pregnant and super impossible for you to carry a pregnancy. Not going to happen. Give it up. And uh, when we did finally give it up is like literally when Alicia got pregnant and she got healthier during her pregnancy. I almost like hate sharing this story because I know plenty of people that aren't given that gift and we legitimately should not have been given that gift, but she got better during her pregnancy. She wasn't able to click carry it quite to full term. Our little boy was born two months premature, three pounds, 14 ounces. And uh, it was nuts, man. I, I remember sitting in this uh, NICU room with this little baby that I could hold in my, my two hands saying like, God, this makes no sense. Like, 
there's healthy people, friends of ours that haven't been given this gift and we shouldn't have been objectively. Like, I don't know why you would do this for us. Thank you, of course, but um, you must have a big plan for, for this kid. You must have a calling for his life. That's the only way that this makes sense. So help me to be a good earthly dad that he would know you as an earthly father. Help me to like un have him understand his calling and his gifts and be prepared for whatever it is you're calling me to or him to. And God met me in this little hospital room and was like, all right, man, well, what if in like 20 or 30 years from now, I come to Anderson and I ask him to go into full-time ministry. And really it doesn't matter if he's got a good excuse or a bad excuse. If he tells me no, how would you feel? And I'm like, oh, for real, wow. Uh, geez, I disappointed. I would feel disappointed and just tangibly, I felt God disappear. He just, just he walked away and let me sit in this disappointment until I, until I gave up and I was like, fine. What, where, how? answer these questions and I'll do it. I'll just freaking do it. And so he answered the questions and we pretty quickly uh, ended up packing up all of our stuff, saying goodbye to an amazing community that we needed desperately. And we moved out here to Denver, Colorado for me to go to seminary. And uh, objectively that, that like Colorado is a great place, man. Like I love the mountains. I love to ski. I should have been pumped about this, but it was awful. I was doing seminary part-time. I was working full-time. I had a, a sick wife who was a 24 hour fall risk and couldn't drive. We had a nine month old baby who couldn't do anything for himself and needed his dad and his dad was nowhere to be found. I hated this so much. I would have like a mental breakdown every three weeks. Like God, either you're a jerk or I misheard you or I don't even care. Like I just, we got to make the, the right move and go back home. And, uh, you know, Alicia being clearly smarter and stronger willed than me, she's like, bro, God's not fickle. You know, we, we knew that this was going to be hard. God's got something for us. We have to see this through. So we, she would talk me off the ledge and be like, all right, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'll get myself together. And then three weeks later, I'd be right back in that place. Just this juggling act was too much for me, man. So this is kind of the genesis of me becoming a pastor and, it's crazy. Like it, it, this story makes no sense to me. I, I, I think God has showed up in absurd ways in the story of suffering and it's a privilege to share even bits of it with people. So thanks. I just rambled a ton, man. Like I see you, you're, you're like chomping at the bit to ask me questions and to jump in and I have not given you an opportunity. So fire back, man, Dom, what you got? <laughs> Yes, indeed, man. So, oh, my goodness, man. So, how was it during the whole COVID situation with you, your wife, and your little one, man? Because I'm pretty sure it just made, added even another big, giant fortress of nonsense on top of everything else. Yeah, dude, great question. Uh, the pandemic season was rough for us. It was a little scary, you know. At, at, you know, by the time the pandemic started, Alicia's life had gotten pretty small. Like, she's pretty much confined to the couch. Like, she gets out of the house, uh, you know, when there's a doctor's appointment or a therapy appointment, uh, you know, mainly it's just medical stuff, you know, we'll, we'll go get our, our hair did and, and whatnot, but like pretty much life is on the couch. It's a small, uh, footprint that she lives in. And when the pandemic happened, that small world just became even smaller. You know, we were, afraid to go to the hospital and get the treatments. We were afraid to like do this and that. Like we, it, it was pretty rough and we had to make a lot of sacrifices. We had to um, be incredibly careful because she's, she's very uh, immune compromised. There's neurological components to her disease. Like um, if she got this, this could be disastrous for her. So, um, you know, I had been working in churches pretty much, um, all the way from like a couple of years in my Colorado experience and uh, just like a month before the pandemic, I had left to start a coaching ministry where I, you know, walk people through their expectation gaps and I, I give away my time for that. And it's awesome. Um, and I intended to be meeting with people face to face, like, you know, right here in my office. And 
uh, a month later, the pandemic happened. That's when the NBA went down. That I'm like, hold on, what? Like, this thing's for real. Like, what is this? I thought this was like just in Asia or on a cruise ship. Like, this is for real for us. Like, what? So I had to do all my coaching suddenly on Zoom, and like, I was we weren't seeing people. That was terrible for us emotionally. Like, we need community, and yet we only have community in two dimensions now. Like, this is this is awful, but it was the sacrifices that we needed to make the decisions we needed to make. And, uh, ultimately we got COVID, uh, a month ago. And, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't just me, it was all of us. And it was pretty scary for her. You know, she, she didn't do well, but she got through it. We never actually had to go to the hospital. Um, it's going to be a long road of recovery for her. Um, she's not totally out of the woods yet, but we've been panicked about this thing. And, you know, there was only so much we could do. And I guess at some point it was inevitable that we were going to get exposed and, um, really thankful that God protected her enough that this wouldn't be the thing to take her down, but she's super fragile. Like not gonna lie. She's say like 67 pounds. Uh, she's skin and bones. Like she, she doesn't have much to fight with. So, yeah, that's a, that's a real deal, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, definitely, definitely rough indeed. And it's such a rare disease, too. Is she, was she the first or one of the few that has it in the world, oh. right? Yeah, she's a complete unicorn. Like, there's not many people like her. Uh, this disease can take on many different forms. There's officially 12 or 13 different types, but it, it plays out differently. Uh, what's crazy is, uh, there's, there's a girl at our church that has the same disease. Uh, it's played out in the same exact way. And I'm not even kidding, Dom. She went to the Mayo clinic and had the same exact experience with this same doctor. Like you're a ruminator. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's crazy. (laughs) Two unicorns in the wild. Like you know, like right there in the same church. It's crazy. And we're so thankful for that relationship, you know, like someone that can like understand and like, we can understand her, you know, it's uh, such a gift that God's given us. It's it, it, like, really the odds of it are astronomical. Uh, Cause I, I, I can't even give you a percentage of how many people in the world have, have what she has in the way that she has, but it is exceptionally low. I wish God would have given us some other gift, you know, like <laughs> this wasn't what we were, what we were hoping for. But I think before we started here today, I, I made the statement that suffering is a gift and that's a messed up statement. It actually is like the most illogical statement I could make, but having experienced it for the last 15 years in real ways, I can actually sit here today and be like, it's been a gift in our lives. It's helped us have a context for hope. Like, how do you have a context for what day is if we don't have night, right? Mm -hmm. If all we had was sunlight and no point the sun went away, it would just be normal, right? But because the sun goes away and we've got nighttime, we can have a context for day. Same way with suffering and hope. I can understand hope in a, like a weird way because of the suffering. So I know on some level, man, I'm like, people listening are like, okay, okay. Like you, you seem just real trite on this. You're just giving me like some lines, but I, I, I deeply believe this. Like, I hate how the Bible talks about suffering, but then always includes the word rejoice in our sufferings with it. Like that used to drive me nuts. Like that's impossible, man. You can't do that. Like it's not the way it's supposed to be, <laughs> but yet that like, it's, it's not like, just like, Hey, this is a good thing to do. It's like, no, 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 no this is imperative. Like you got to do this. And when you can learn to, when you can learn to not take yourself too seriously, man, things change. Like I, I hate how sick Alicia is. I hate all this suffering. I hate these terrible experiences, but I don't know if this, at at this point I would trade, trade it for anything because man, I've got a ministry that is like blowing my mind and I'm seeing people like, transform in real ways and learning to trust Jesus in the midst of these awful expectation gaps and they're learning what hope is. And it's like, yeah, like I, I want to be about that. Like that, that isn't just like my glory. That's like, we're we're multiplying, like it's crazy. So 
yeah, that's, that's why it's important for me to share my story, man. I appreciate you letting me do this. This is awesome. Oh yeah, man. Definitely. Definitely, man. And, and to be honest, like, even though some may say, Hey, suffering is a gift. Like, Hey, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's actually true in some, some situations. Heck, even it's a big part of the Buddhist tradition as well it's, it's mm. life is suffering. So it's like, it's, it's not too far off from the truth and, even though there's some who may fight against that and be like, hey, well, it's just a philosophy to consider, especially when you go through the times that you and your family are going through right now with Alicia mm-hmm. and everybody else. So my goodness, man. So with this book, like what was the process like? And I'm pretty sure Alicia may have contributed some of it <laughs> as well, I can imagine. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, I made the decision pretty early on that it would be my book. Um, as opposed to our book, which um, I don't know, I, I, I like, I think the reason behind that feeling important was, I think there's a lot of books for the person like going through the pain. I think there's a lot of resource there. Um, there's less out there for the caregiver. There's less oh, out there yeah. spoken to the husband, you know, and uh, I, I really wanted to write that story because certainly Alicia is the one going through the pain, the one going through the suffering, but so am I (laughs) like, this has broken me in, in unique ways. Like just because this is like her thing, doesn't mean this isn't our thing. And so I wanted to like give people that perspective and really the impetus for writing this book. Like I, I never had this on my radar at all. Um, we had stumbled into uh, a meeting with a doctor, a chance meeting that she suggested this therapy that, that could help Alicia. And it hasn't improved her health, but it's given her this season of plateau. Like she's not losing like she was. Like I'm telling you, she was losing fast. And so it's like this plateau, probably she's still losing to some degree, but it's, it's slowly, it's not to the same speed. And as we're going through this and things we're experiencing this plateau, suddenly out of the blue, the insurance company's like, yeah, we're not going to pay for that anymore. Like we're, <laughs> we're not covering that. And that was devastating. I'm like, you can't do this. Like, this is why she's still alive today. And I was like, okay, well, how much is this going to cost for us to pay for it privately? And the answer was, okay, it's $300,000 a year. And I'm like, uh, uh I'm, I'm a pastor, man. Like I don't make anywhere close to that. How do I do this? I, I was panicking. It was like so petrifying for me. Like, all right, all right. I got to get creative. How are we going to do this? So I decided like, uh, you know, I could do like, just like a, uh, you know, go fund me kind of thing. Like I could do, you know, people just raise money for us, but I was like, no, I'm committed to sharing our story. So I decided I was going to get this website. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was called I write to save my wife.com. And I would just start sharing like chapters of our story every week or every other week on, on there. And I was like, share it guys. Like, please like send it out. Like, let's make this go viral. I'm not trying to get famous. I'm just trying to get this to Oprah because Oprah can write this Jack check and she can save us. Like save us Oprah. Like it was just like, (laughs) 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 It, it, it it was the only thing I could like figure out to do. Like, like what options do we have where we got to get creative to come up with a solution. So I was like trying to get people to share it and it, it got shared pretty well. Um, it didn't make it to Oprah. Like she never wrote that check. Um, Oprah, if you're listening, uh, we could probably still use your help. So like, don't forget us, but um, <laughs> Oprah listens, right, Dom? Right. Yeah, I know. I know she does. Don't worry about that. Anyways, I was sharing this thing and in the midst of all this, man, like, the toll of this many years of, of like suffering and uh, expectation gaps and stuff had taken a toll on me. And I was really facing some like real depression at that time. And the act of writing this book was like sinking my battleship in real ways. And people started to like reach out to us from like weird corners of the world. Like, Hey, I'm a missionary in like Portugal or something like, I, I saw this on Facebook. It had gotten shared to me and I've been reading along and it's touching me because I've got MS and I've, you know, I'm dealing with this problem and that problem and I'm a missionary and it, like serving God's really hard right now. So hearing your story is like giving me something. And it, like, 
that was like really edifying to me, but it also like freaked me out. Like it was like, people were like almost asking me for more. And I was like, I don't have more to give. Like, this is so much like my depression's real. And I kind of just got to the point. I was like, I can't write anymore. Like this is like, now people are depending on me to write like, ah, so I walked away from it. I kind of stopped hidden publish on the website and uh, eventually the insurance company uh, gave us the treatment back. We won an appeals process, which was not easy, but you know, Alicia got back on the, on the treatment, got back on the plan. Yeah. Come on, dude. Like we got to dance for that. Cause like, that's something to celebrate about, man. But you know, years down the road, I, I eventually got some help for depression. I went away to a treatment center and really owned my problems and it was great. Like God used even that part. And uh, I, I think uh, eventually between the sick wife narrative and this open bout of depression that I was pretty public with, I, I shared a lot at church and, you know, as wide as I could. And, you know, people just started coming to me like, man, I'm going through some real stuff right now. Like no one in this world could understand, but maybe you, you've gone through so much. Like, could we hang out? Could I share my story of suffering? I'm, I'm, of course, like I would love that. And I was doing that all the time and I was unknowingly uh, unbeknownst to me, I was coaching people through what I would later know as their expectation gaps. And I was loving it. And I was like, God, I just want to do that. Like, can I somehow be a freelance pastor and just do that? And he quickly developed that plan. And I left the church world to do this. And it's been like the best thing ever. Um, and kind of in that process of leaving the church and starting this coaching ministry, tillercoaching.org, shout out to that. If anyone's out there experiencing an expectation gap, I shouldn't miss that opportunity. But I felt this calling to get back to the book. Like, man, I, I hated this book. I hated what, what, like all this stuff, but I was like, I'm healthy now. I feel like God's saying now's the time to do it. And I'm so glad that I did. I've, I've started to get those letters and those emails and those, you know, like DMS and stuff from people in weird parts of the world because they <laughs> got a hold of the book. Someone shared it with them and they're saying the same stuff, man. Like I needed to read this. You've encouraged me in ways no one else ever could. And like, what a gift God's given me through your story. And I'm like, awesome. Can we talk? I'd love to encourage you in like direct, like it's just opened up this like world of possibilities. So once again, man, I've hated this story so much. It's, uh, I never wanted to be the suffering guy, but it's a privilege to be a suffering guy. It really is. So that's my story, man. How about that? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, all right. So we're going to need a part two for this episode. Indeed. Definitely need a part two. Indeed. Because my goodness, a whole a lot of stuff to unpack, man. But glad you're able to really finish the book because I'm, yeah, because I'm pretty sure, like, through the process, I know it can be painful. Because writing can heal, but it's still, like, you're still reliving those moments and just figuring out what stories to add, which ones to take out, and then, of course, the editing and everything else. And also glad you put an audio book as well. So for, for those folks who are on the go, it's like, hey, the supper guy's on the go, baby. That's right, indeed. <laughs> it's We're on the Good Samaritan swag, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate that. Like, Burn that credit. I know you got a credit sitting in your Audible account. Burn that credit. <laughs> if you could deal with this voice for six and a half hours, like uh, you'll hear a good story. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, my goodness, since you've appeared on a few podcasts, I know you did a solo podcast of your own. Uh, Right about a few months ago, back in 2021, I'm pretty sure my man has been asked a bunch of questions, but is there a particular question folks would ask you more often when you're on the guest side of the mic? Ooh, uh, wow. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of really unique questions. I've, I've been doing a lot of these little podcasts around the country, uh, just trying to share the story that God's given us. And uh, the the most common question I get is, how like you you talk about celebrating in the midst of suffering and that's that that doesn't make any sense like how do you tell people how to do that and uh you know the answer to that question for me is like yeah it's the most illogical thing to do but it's the po best possible thing you can do 
you know, when I, when I coach people through expectation gaps, one of the things I say is like the best way to overcome these expectation gaps is to own reality and have gratitude and celebration for what is real. So case in point, like Alicia and I have, have experienced tragic things that have been unspeakably hard to celebrate. We laugh a lot, (laughs) you know, we, we make fun of our situation. We make fun of ourselves in the situation. We just get really authentic and really real. And we choose to not take ourselves too seriously. And it's sometimes, it's, it's sometimes uncomfortable for people. Like a guy I used to work with at, at my previous church was like, man, it, it, it hurts my soul when you like make jokes about like Alicia not being dead yet. I'm like, why? Like, she's not dead yet. Like, we should, we should like laugh about that. We should cry about that. We should like experience the gamut of like emotions. Like that is, that's incredible. I'm not trying to make fun of her. I'm trying to say, Hey, this is scary, but like, I'm not going to let it get the best of me. Now, of course, am I perfect at that? No way. Like, no, how there's just, there's, there's obviously some hard days for us. Like there's some days where I like my de- depression creeps back in and it's like, I, you know, I'm going to kind of chill in bed a little bit today, but like for real, the thing that gets me out of bed is like, I can, I can laugh about this. I can celebrate in the midst of this because God is doing absurd stuff. Like he just is. It's really easy to focus on our pain, but I think there's a purpose to our pain when we can like get outside of ourselves and we cannot take ourselves too seriously um, we can begin to have a context for celebrating what's hard, but what's real. And it becomes like, like life takes on like new shapes and new colors. And it's like oddly beautiful. So yeah, like I, I, I my book, it adds a lot of humor and uh, I just try to model, like, what does it look like to celebrate and not take yourself too seriously? I try to live it. We've been pretty loose here today, which probably isn't like if people are looking at like the show notes and stuff, like, Oh, the suffering guy. This is going to be a downer episode. I don't want to listen to this, (laughs) but like, come on, man. Like the reality is, is we are all going to suffer. Like maybe not a hundred percent of us are suffering today, but a hundred percent of us will suffer. So like it's, it's the pathway towards heaven. Like death and tribulation is part of it. Let's not like, this isn't the end all be all like what we're experiencing today. Yeah. It's, it's, it's big time, but it's, it's not like our ultimate reality. Our bodies are going to experience pain and break down, but like our souls can be built up at the same time. So let's focus more on that, man. Like it's, it's, it's doable. Ah, yes, indeed. Doable, indeed. Doable, indeed. So my goodness, coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're going to wake up tomorrow and you were at 25 again, but you're still in 2022 with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Oh man, I wish I would have understood the power of my story like years and years ago. This is a new revelation for me. I think that story is our greatest tool and our greatest gift uh, that we give other people. It's a great tool for evangelism, you know, going to seminary, you can easily fall into the trap of like learning all this great stuff about theology and apologetics and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like I I remember a lot of seminary kids just having a ton of debates and loving that and, you know, getting ready to debate people in the real world. And I'm like, dude, no, that can't be, that can't be the way to do it. Like, you, you debate someone, you're just starting a, an argument. Like, what, what is that? Like, I think our story is, is the, the best and really the only way to start if we want to evangelize to people. Like, how have we been broken? How did we meet Jesus? How did he transform us? We do that? Like, the theology comes later, man. Like, no one cares what you know until they know how much you care. Like, just share your story, man. Like, instead of starting a debate or a fight, like, we're starting a conversation that other person's going to um, probably ask questions about your story. They're probably going to share their own story. And we're off and running, man. I want to build relationships with people, not, not, not arguments. So I wish I would have known that when I was 25, like that's, that's big time. I would have had such a good head start in life, but at least I learned it. Grateful for that. 
<laughs> Heck yeah, dude. That's what I'm talking about indeed. And Pop, glad what you mentioned about the storytelling too. Cause you're so right. And and that vibe can definitely happen. Cause um, went to a Christian school myself, and we had like a my senior year, we had like a pastor come in, and they gave us like a entry level seminary course graduation year. Cause I just it was like all about Bible doctrines and whatnot. I'm like, man, and like just comparing myself now to back then is like kind of really dogmatic back then and mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, mm-hmm. and I can only imagine what would happen if you get years in a seminary depending on whichever school you go to it's like oh yeah let's debate everybody let's prove this bible is right <laughs> king james yeah. version all day man <laughs> like <laughs> so <laughs> oh my gosh it's great yeah you're right you're right like we'll even debate the versions like oh geez come on <laughs> yeah i can understand why it's to be like that but it's like yeah, yeah. but that's all conversation of the day but we definitely gotta have you back for a part two man definitely gotta have you back for oh, man i would i would love two. that it'd be an honor we should do that for sure and uh i obviously can talk i obviously have a lot of stories to share and uh i i would love it let's make it happen Yes, indeed. That's right, indeed. Make it happen like all the Captain Crunch, y'all. That's right, indeed. (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) And for those who need to take a good crunch out of all the stuff that you're doing and buy some copies of your book and share with their friends, family, heck, maybe even some camels when it's not even hump day, what's the best way for folks to do so? That's great, man. Uh, TheSufferingGuy.com is my website. The book is available on Amazon in all the different formats, obviously on Audible. Uh, I can hear all those people burning them credits right now. Um, yeah, man, the, the, this book is is crazy. And I, I really hope that people take a, take a few moments to engage in it. It's a pretty quick read. I, I, it's really light and, and honestly like a funny book. Uh, learning how to not take ourselves too seriously. So check it out. I, I'd really love to engage with you. I'm on Instagram at thesufferingguy.com. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, <laughs> folks. There you have it, folks. That's right, indeed. Uh, I can't believe I just thought of this. It's <laughs> Mr. P, B, and J, baby. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Pastor Jim B, baby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no one's ever said that before. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's right, Dave. So reach out to the good Jim himself, Pastor Jim himself, baby. Master PB&J, baby. The PB&J himself, baby. He's got you <laughs> covered, man. I told you, if you got expectations, that's up to high heaven and all the way to Andromeda Galaxy. He'll help you get back down to Earth and advance even faster than you ever thought before, folks. That's right, mm. indeed. That's right, indeed, because a man's mm. been through it, and he knows how to help others get through it to their next level and. Indeed. So any parting words before we close up shop, Jim? Tom, I'm just blessed by you, man. You are out there doing some good work, helping people share some hard stories and uh, encouraging people in ridiculous ways. So don't stop, man. This is this is big time. Hey, you. Yeah, you. The one listening right now. Thanks a bunch for sharing some of your time out of your day to listen to this podcast. To take it to the next level, be sure to share it with someone that you care about and that would get something out of this podcast to advance others, to advance yourself.